Hej och hjärtligt välkomna till dagens talkshow för internetdagarna. Det här är den andra i ordningen av tre som kommer. Och vi håller den första delen av talkshowen på engelska på grund av att vi har en gäst som är engelskspråkig. Sen så kommer jag också passa på att tala om för er att eh, vi kör en rabatt idag. Under talkshowen så kan ni få 1000 kronor i rabatt om ni köper en biljett, en två dagars biljett till internetdagarna till vår show. Så, därmed tänkte jag börja med att hälsa mina gäster välkomna. Förlåt, först Svante, ursäkta mig, du sitter lite. Vid min sida idag så har jag Svante Nygren. Kan du säga någonting om dig själv? Ja, till vardags på Myndigheten för samhällsskydd och beredskap. Jobbar med analys där på säkerhetsområdet. Mm. Och själv då kanske jag ska komma ihåg och presentera mig. Ann-Marie Eklund och Winder och jobbar på .st som kvalitets- och säkerhetschef. Så, nu är vi tillbaka. Welcome. I would like to introduce to you uh, Joni Brennan from the Kantara Initiative and Fredrik Ljunggren from Cure. So this first part of the talk show will, will be about of course the Kantara initiative but we will go deeper into electronic identification federations and that kind of stuff and i would like to start to ask you Joni, what is the Kantara initiative could you tell us please sure um also thank you for having me here today for this interview we appreciate the opportunity um the Kantara initiative is a non-profit organization it uh is a certifying body both of operational interoperability and technical interoperability. So it's helping the community in that way by providing trust through um, certification programs. It's also an uh, standards foster fostering environment, um, developing standards, harmonizing existing um, protocol policy um, for also for potential contribution of, of these new um, protocol and existing protocol harmonizations into more traditional standards bodies uh, like ISO or ITUT, the international bodies. So we are both a certifying body and a uh, standards harmonization organization as well. Okay. And uh, how would you say that the Kantara initiative would benefit for, instance, Swedish users? So in the Kantara initiative, we have a, a broad stakeholder representation. Um, North America, Europe, Scandinavia, Asia. And what we do is we help connect all of these different um, communities through sharing of uh, successes and failures so that they can learn and work to better their, their own systems and also provide examples. So uh, we could help in one way by connecting, helping to connect Sweden with other um, entities or, or jurisdictions or countries um, to help move forward that way. We also feel that we have a lot that we could learn from Sweden, from the market, from .se as well. Um, as a trusted brand within uh, the, the Swedish market, we think that it's a good opportunity to work together to learn from the successes that you have already have and are fostering in Sweden as well. Okay, so I don't know whether you are aware of the PM from the governmental investigation that was looking into the electronic identification market in Sweden and it, they have actually suggested some solutions and they are pointing to the Kantara initiative for selecting the assurance level, different assurance levels that you specify. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Sure, so um, in the identity assurance framework there are four levels of assurance that are specified. Um, these come from, um, they're based around and aligning with um, NIST special publication 863. So this is an early publication that kind of set the boundaries on the levels of assurance. Um, the levels of assurance go from one through four and the one through four is, one is a low risk context. So maybe something like putting a comment onto a news site, something that kind of has low risk for your reputation and low risk financially and, and privacy based, all the way up to a level four, which is something that would be very high risk, a high money transaction, um, potentially some sort of interaction with the government. So within those levels of assurance, um, organizations can do their risk profile assessment and decide what kind of transactions they're actually doing, how risky those transactions are, and then apply the level of assurance that is appropriate for the types of transactions that they're trying to facilitate. 
Okay. So what is the largest difficulties to find a general model that will actually work internationally in the global perspective? One of the largest challenges is um, jurisdictional, jurisdictional issues. So you have issues um, that are both internal, say, to, to a country, for example, in the United States. We have lots of states that we have to rationalize the different state governments. Um, in Sweden, you have different municipalities. In Canada, you have different provinces. So, so you have the internal um, jurisdictional issues to, to, to align. And then you have an international um, layer that you are trying to align. And what we do in Kantara is we have a baseline of um, criteria that can be assessed against. And what we also do and are fostering is a set of profiles, which can then be tailored specific to the different um, constraints. So for example, something around Article 29 privacy for Europe is a specific area where when we have differences that are brought through gap analysis can be addressed through profiling specifically. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, Frederick, you were a part of, of this uh, investigation, and mm -hmm. how much impression did you take from the Kantara Initiative in this work? I think uh, we, we read the uh, Identity Assurance Framework really closely, and uh, we had to do some adoptance. It was still in a draft, mm -hmm. uh, version 2 draft, uh, to actually fit the more, the, the kind of view we have on identities here in Sweden, which differs largely uh, between European countries and uh, between Europe and the United States as well. Mm -hmm. So for this reason we had to kind of boil it down, but we, we, we recognize that as the, uh, the most prominent effort to actually do a harmonization of assurance levels. So we wanted it to be compatible, but something that uh, everyone that was used to reading the Swedish kind of uh, assurance level which we have today for the EU authentication, that they would harmonize in the way. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, it's more of a translation. <coughs> uh, cultural differences makes it uh, that there that have to be an adoption. Okay, so if uh, we should mention that we have been actually struggling with uh, PKI in, in Sweden and in several different countries, mm -hmm. I know for like 15 years maybe, mm -hmm. without getting so much further, even though we have come, come some way mm -hmm. in Sweden, uh, what would you say is the biggest difference with this model? compared to the or traditional yeah. PKI model. Yeah, so, so this is the level of above. It, it doesn't really disqualify PKI from the map. It's, it's something that it's an abstraction layer on top of something, but it doesn't either require one PKI. It can be many one. And uh, each identity provider can have their own PKI, if that is something you want. But uh, you can also have fit other models uh, into this, like uh, we used to the uh, kind of tokens we have for logging onto our banks, mm -hmm. uh, those could be used directly instead of using certificates. And so, so it's, it's kind of something that abstracts the mechanism for authentication. Okay. Yeah. So what is the hope for the future? How fast do you think that the, this development will go, both of you? Well, the hope for the future is that we can, through pilot projects, some of which are already occurring through certifications, um, at, we've already had some certifications uh, to this kind of trust framework model, which is the identity assurance framework as part of. Um, we've had some low level of assurance come through. That is a lower bar with the self-assertion of what kind of criteria are being met. Um, we've got larger organizations coming through now that are, it takes them a bit longer because they have a higher risk profile and they have more to do to, to meet those bars. So I think that we're absolutely moving in the right direction. Mm -hmm. We've got a strong core to work from and uh, we're, we're working to foster different pilots to show the value of those services and, and the savings that can be accomplished through, through trust and through certified trust. Mm -hmm. And from the end user point of view, what is the, the benefit with being part of a federation? I, I think that uh, <coughs> the benefit is that you will not have to have several different methods of uh, authenticating yourself. You don't have to have hundreds of accounts or passwords or whatever it is. You, you, you could, in the end, in the long term, actually use some kind of universal uh, electronic identity to, to access 
all, all your kind of services which you need uh, from day to day. Mm -hmm. And um, that's kind of the big benefit, I think, for the user. So, and that's more about simplicity than security. People don't really think about, I want to be more secure. Well, uh, one part of it is uh, that we, this can be used with like uh, username and password as well. Mm -hmm. But um, if we're looking at uh, what the e authentication board here in Sweden works with is something that would be assurance level three, which probably be some kind of token which you would use. Uh, instead. So in this term it will be both security and convenience for the user. Excuse me, but yeah, yes. <coughs> this, uh, this sounds very very much like a policy issue rather than a technical issue. Is, is that the main part of the work, working out policy? Yeah, I, I would say for sure. Um, there are many technical solutions that are existing and I think that uh, many of the problems have are it, technically solved. There are, there are protocol and, and ways to solve these problems that apply differently and work differently. Um, there are good solutions for each kind of context and that solution may be different based on the context but those solutions are there and so what we're doing now is kind of bridging the policy with the technology and by creating that bridge that's where we can achieve that level of trust and that helps the user because what you want to do is provide the user with that security, but not make it such that they it's going to be too difficult for them to understand or too difficult for them to even participate in the system. Mm -hmm. So you want to ease of use is a, is a very important issue. Um, and through the bridging of the policies with the technology, then that's where we're working to kind of put all of these pieces together because we feel that we've come a, a very long way with the pieces and now it's just about putting them together mm -hmm. to make them work. Let, let me ask me, me uh, let me ask a dumb question here. Then, who will be at the top? I mean, if we remember the '90s and the SSL certificates, as, uh, etc., we let everyone be at the top, and we ended up with like 600, 650 certificate authorities. Mm -hmm. uh, could you explain the, the the system in a framework in a few words? Yeah, I think that. There's there's a balance that needs to be reconciled. Um, the, I think the, at the end, the user needs to have choices. If we look at it from the user level, the user needs to have choices of, of identity providers that they can trust and identity providers they can trust based on the context. But the goal is not to continually recreate and reinvent systems so many that you, you are not able to achieve interoperability. So somewhere in between where you have the user has choice, organizations can choose which solutions to deploy. Um, but that you don't have so many that you can still achieve that interoperability and as long as the the different amount of choices and the different organizations that you're working with are t working to a certain level of standardization mm -hmm. through certification, through operational certification, meaning is this an organization that I can trust? Can I trust that they're not going to close up shop and disappear tomorrow? Mm -hmm. And through technical uh, standards and deployment profiles, it's through interoperability that that key is really solved. So it's more like interoperability in your mm -hmm. works. Yeah. I would like to, to turn over to Fredrik, and because this is only one part of the puzzle, solving uh, the security matters we have in the internet today. And uh, now when we have possibilities to identify the person, the individual, mm -hmm. we still have to be able to identify email, servers, mm -hmm. whatever on the internet. And I know there is some progress going on even there. Yes, it is. And um, I think that that's an important thing to realize that uh, user authentication is one problem and uh, secure email or uh, web server authentication is, is a completely different problem which requires different technology. And uh, for this reason, since uh, the advent of DNSSEC and that we actually have something uh, which is global and universal, where we can use, which we can use for key distribution. Uh, we could actually use DNSSEC for uh, securing both email and uh, web transactions. Mm -hmm. And uh, so within uh, the IETF, uh, we're currently engaged in, um, in writing up a standard, which is uh, called DANE, uh, which specifies how public key distribution within DNSSEC would work. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and th that would solve the problem which we see today where we have this 650 certification authorities which 
definitely not everyone can be trusted. We have seen ex mm. examples of that. Mm. And uh, Dane brings multiple mechanisms into work for, for actually securing this. And uh, the most basic part of it is that a domain holder uh, will be able to specify which certification authority they have hired to actually certify themselves. So they can kind of cut out the, all the other parts of those 650 certification authorities. And uh, the next thing is that a domain holder can itself just be identified through its domain name. And uh, that's something that we think will drastically change uh, the number of websites which are secure today. Mm. And, uh, and finally, you as a user would also be able to publish your public key into the DNS and receive uh, encrypted email. And you, if you turn that mechanism around, you can send uh, signed email as well. So, so the, the, yeah. uh, oh, sorry. DNS security is really uh, a strategic technology here in the development of internet. Yeah, so. I would say that. And uh, I, I think that... Uh, we haven't seen the potential of DNSSEC yet. No. And uh, w when we have that kind of this global catalog, which we have dreamed of for decades now, uh, we can actually start putting in security mechanisms there. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and a matter of fact, we have been doing that for a while, like SSH. We have. Yeah. Uh, so not, not everyone, though, but no, uh, some of us have. Yeah, <laughs> it's possible to do it. Yeah. And we are very proud of it at dot .se since we signed our own 2005, we mm. actually talked about having DNS as a container for other security attributes. I think mm. it's just great, excellent. Yep. Okay. okay, thank you very much thank for coming you. Thank here. Thank you. Thank you.